Our next session is uh, on emerging new offshore wind markets in Asia, status challenges and opportunities. And to moderate this session, I would like to, for everyone to welcome to the stage Mr. Mark Laybourne from the World Bank Group. Mark is the co-lead of the World Bank Group's offshore wind development program. He's part of the ESMAP Energy Sector Management Program team within the World Bank, and he's worked in the offshore energy renewable sectors for the past 13 years. The World Bank have played a major role in bringing international delegations to this conference, and so we are particularly indebted to the work of the World Bank, and the Global Wind Energy Council works very closely with the World Bank uh, across many markets and across many initiatives. So please welcome Mr. Mark Laybourne. Thank you, Stuart. And good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Mark Laybourne. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. Um, it's great to see so many people in the room. And this is going to be an exciting session. We've got quite a few countries to talk about. And I'm going to ask my panelists to come on stage and uh, take a seat, please. Don't be shy. So throughout this session, I'm sure there'll be lots of questions that come into your mind. Please use the app and submit your questions into that app. We'll try and take some of those questions at the end if we have enough time. But as you can see, we have quite a few panelists today and uh, only a little bit of time to get through uh, quite a few questions. So we'll see how we do on time. I'm going to start by asking each of our panelists to give a short introduction about themselves, um, their affiliation, the country that they're from and talking about, um, and just explain a little bit about your, um, your background in, in offshore wind or your interest in offshore wind. So why don't we start uh, on the, the left-hand side of the stage over here, so Mika, if you could, <laughs> don't put you on the spot, yeah. give us an introduction, thanks. My name is Mika Obayashi, director at the Renewable Energy Institute based in Tokyo. Actually, I sit here, maybe I will be the last person to speak, but uh, first that I have to speak. So our institute, REI, is a think tank that is independent, independent of government and the industry. It is working to promote Japan's energy transition, focusing on the, um, the power sector and the industrial sector. For offshore wind, uh, we have set up the team and made intensive policy recommendations over the last few years. These include conducting industry roundtable talk with the developers to expose market barriers in Japan, and also hold Holding study groups with fishermen and academics, and then recommending a framework to promote fish, the regional symbiosis, and conducting research on the economic benefits of offshore wind. Those are what we are doing related to the offshore wind. Hi, my name is Yihuan Lu, and I'm the head of APAC for Corio Generation. Uh, Corio Generation is a 100% owned subsidiary of Macquarie Group, and, and we were set up for one purpose and one purpose only, which is globally to develop greenfield offshore wind projects. Uh, globally, we have a development pipeline of more than 30 gigawatts, of which more than 15 gigawatts actually fall in the APAC region. So it is very exciting. Uh, personally, I've been, I, I describe myself as a reform banker, so I started in the banking side of things, but I've been looking at offshore wind for almost a decade now. Uh, I'm very excited to, to sort of work for Corio and be here today, and in terms of what my team does throughout the, the region, we look at everything from new, new market entry into exciting markets such as you know, India and Sri Lanka, Philippines, as well as you know, pushing forward uh, on projects in more established markets, so in the APAC region, you know, Taiwan's a good one, um, where we've got, and Taiwan and, and South Korea, where we have some mid to late stage development projects. Um, yep, thank you. Hello, good afternoon. I'm Rodel Limbaga from the Department of Energy, Philippines. Uh, as we all know, the Department of Energy is aggressively pursuing cleaner energy by aspiring to have a 30% uh, share of RE by 2030 and around 50% by 2050. Now, it is the Department of Ener Energy's role to ensure that there will be enough transmission capacity when the first offshore wind uh, comes online. 
by 2028. Thank you so much. Hi, I'm uh, Ranjit Sepala. I'm from uh, Sri Lanka, and I'm the chairman to uh, Sustainable Energy Authority. Actually, uh, Sustainable Energy Authority is responsible for development of uh, renewable energy to the country, and the uh, give the uh, I mean the give, uh, reserving the uh, sites or the locations to the developer, and they make the uh, roadmap for the renewable energy development. So uh, offshore wind is very new to Sri Lanka, and uh, we are planning to, uh, we all, recently we already uh, you know, uh, declared the roadmap and how we and how we achieve the future and how we achieve the goals uh, with our requirement. So this is just beginning, but I hope we can uh, accelerate with getting support from the other uh, countries and other organization uh, with their lessons learned. Thank you. Namaste, this is Pradeep Kumar Das. I'm chairman and managing director of Indian Renewable Energy Development Agency. <clears throat> it's the largest uh, green finance lender in India. And as you all know that India is the fourth largest capacity holder agenda in RE and uh, third largest uh, additional capacity addition in last five years in the global uh, level. And uh, we have the target of going to 500 gigawatt of installation in RE by 2030. That is one of our, one of the five commitment of the COP program, what our Honorable Prime Minister has done. And out of that 500, already 180 plus around we have done. So remaining, uh, what we are going to get, 30 gigawatt we are going to achieve from offshore wind, and uh, it is just, I would like to inform, as on date we have 44 gigawatt of wind capacity and another 16 in pipeline. So if you consider the pipeline also, it is become, becoming total 60. So after 76 years of independence, total wind capacity is 60, and we're planning to have in just seven years another 30, that too from offshore wind, so that itself is a big commitment. And uh, we are uh, working on the challenges and uh, in a holistic approach, style, uh, considering the clearances and uh, challenges with respect to financing and policy, etc. So we'll be discussing in detail in the discussion. Thank you. So I am uh, Wen Chung, the Deputy General and in charge of the Industry and Department of uh, Central Economic uh, Commission of the Party uh, Vietnam. So um, <clears throat> I'm uh, very uh, pleased uh, to come here to join in this uh, discussion. And uh, as you know that uh, Vietnam, we have a very uh, good uh, potential for the offshore wind with the uh, long uh, beach and uh, very good uh, uh, speed uh, of the wind. So uh, we are very keen in uh, development of the offshore wind industry. So uh, for the uh, potential uh, of Vietnam as per the preliminary uh, data, so uh, we have about uh, uh, five, uh, 205 gigawatt uh, offshore wind uh, in the total of the, the uh, uh, offshore wind uh, capacity potential up to uh, 500 uh, gigawatt. So uh, uh, recently we have approved the PPD-8. It is a very important uh, uh, legal uh, document for us uh, to speed up the uh, offshore wind uh, development in uh, Vietnam. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. So there is a, a lot of potential across Certainly these four countries that we've just heard from the, the government representatives, um, there's a big, big opportunity there. Um, perhaps we could just talk a bit about uh, why your country is developing offshore wind. Why does it need offshore wind? Um, and perhaps some, talk about some of the benefits that you think or you would like to see from offshore wind. So, Rodel, why don't we start with you and then we'll come this way and then I'll come back to you at the end. Uh, yes. Good afternoon again. Thank you for the question, Mark. Well, the pursuance of uh, offshore wind is part of the energy transition 
policy of the Department of Energy. As mentioned earlier, we are, we are aggressively pursuing re renewable energy share in our generation mix, one of which is uh, identified as potential from offshore wind. As of late last month, we have issued 77 service contracts for wind with an approximate uh, gigawatt capacity of 60.3 gigawatt. So that's a lot. Thank you. And, and just to follow up, is, is that uh, purely around decarbonization? Are you looking to add offshore wind to diversify your grid, are looking to provide jobs? Are there other benefits that you're looking to bring from offshore wind? I think you mentioned it all, uh, part of which is energy security, job generation, and among others. Thank you, Mark. Thanks, Rodel. Mr. Zapala. Actually, before start, before thinking of uh, uh, offshore wind, we, we were depend on the hydro. But uh, with the energy demand, so then whether we like it or not, we switch to the fossil fuel generators. But uh, as you mentioned, think about the energy security and the uh, uh, availability of the resources, the government decided to go for uh, development of the uh, solar and onshore wind. So um, why we need the offshore wind? Yes, of course, solar we can get in the daytime, but if we get the wind, we can use the day and night both, and I think uh, specifically night, we need the more energy to, uh, uh, you know, the supply for the customer's demand. So when we consider the onshore wind and the offshore wind, offshore wind having the more plant factor, so that means compare with the hydro, it is more than that. So then we have to get that. And uh, we, our, our, our aim is to uh, run the, switch the base load with the renewable in the near future. And are there um, opportunities to export some of that power potentially as well? <clears throat> yeah, exactly. Uh, now uh, the government is planning to uh, uh, cross-border connection with the, uh, Sri Lanka and India. So then uh, it is a great advantage for us. Either we not buy from the India, but when it is excess power, so then definitely we can uh, uh, export to the uh, Indian uh, grid. Since uh, uh, we don't want to curtail, otherwise we have to curtail the power. Like that, when we, when we need to uh, uh, energy, so then we can exchange from the uh, India as well. I think it is a benefit for the both countries. And not only that, we can go beyond the uh, Indian, uh, uh, India, so then other countries, like the Sark countries. So we are get together in the Sark region. So then we can cater other countries as well. Mr. Das. Thank you. Yeah, let us uh, go to the basic of why we are uh, going for offshore wind. And uh, first of all, uh, we should not go for solar at all. The reason is, if you are going for solar, you are occupying the land. And it is occupying for 25 years. Who can guarantee which land is barren and are not useful today, it will continue to be useless till 25 years. The way the technological changes are happening and ecological balance is happening. So therefore, our least priority should be solar. But if you see, India has grown last nine years, 26 times in solar. And then, uh, the solar sector in India is fairly matured now. Now coming to onshore wind. Again, that is occupying, going to occupy your land. In offshore wind, we have opportunity for using which we have not explored. So whatever <coughs> opportunity available from the mother nature, the resources, that we should explore first. And see what is the limited resource. Those are used minimum. That is first year. Second, <coughs> Uh, <clears throat> when India has commitment of going for uh, 500 gigawatt by 2030, this is just a global commitment we have given, but our internal plan is to achieve before that also. Because we are working in a model to become a developed economy by when we complete 100 years of our independence by 2047. And then we have the commitment of making net zero by 2070. Huge amount of capital investment in all sector is going to happen. And our GDP is growing and will continue to grow much higher than the world average. So per 1% of GDP growth, we need at least 1.25 to 1.4% 1 uh, of energy growth. And that energy has to come from uh, non-fossil. 
And when you talk about non-fossil, then you have to look into uh, observing green hydrogen. And to make a balancing of it of, on your grid, you need to go for storage, maybe pump storage, battery storage, etc. Coming back to observing, observing, yes, as on that, uh, I was talking in the earlier morning panel that uh, if you see the observing's uh, construction period, on observing's construction period, it is 1.5 to 2 years. Whereas if you look at this, in India, we have calculated to be six to seven years. And the cost part, if you see, it is exactly three to three and a half times of what the cost is. Now, when <coughs> what as a lender, as a policymaker, we have to address these two issues. So first, we have to reduce the uh, reduction time of your project construction. So we have a single point uh, window clearance uh, coordination point of NIVE, which is extended arm of MNRE Government of India, who will be coordinating with all the agencies for arranging all your clearance and all, which we are envisaging to bring the restriction within two years. Like in onshore, we have one year. So offshore, for we are going to have two years. That is fairly much better than what the, the established offshore wind players have done as on it. Second, <clears throat> once this time is addressed, then your interest during construction period is going to be quite low. So which in turn is going to reduce your total project cost. Now coming back to second, you have all the uh, components like uh, manufacturing and supply chain, three major issues, manufacturing and supply chain finance, project development, service such as EPC and OM. See, each component itself is an industry. The EPC for wind sector is, itself is an industry. And OM itself is, a, is an industry. And uh, if you look at uh, manufacturing and supply chain, what we have planned, and we seek the support and uh, uh, guidance from the developed economy who have already established. See, invoice or receivable based financing for suppliers, that is your buyer's assurance. Then inventory financing to manage working capital issues for manufacturers, given the lumpy nature of uh, product upstake. Then letter of comfort to serve as a bridge for international loans for import of components, metals by the manufacturers. Equipment guarantee support to select offshore wind manufacturers after careful assessment of technology specification and performance test of their product along the lines of first loss guarantee support model. This is what manufacturing and supply chain part as a lender, which lender is ultimately going to tell you yes or no. So project development, if you look at, the project size is bigger. As a lender, we are not competent capable within the broad framework of the central bank's governance standards because the capital equity base, what is required, for which we are going to enhance through our IPO soon. But nevertheless, we are suggesting and planning and have a strategy in place to go for consortium-based financing, support of high capex requirement. For observe when anchored by specialist renewable financing agency, such as our organization, IREDA, which can ensure adequacy of fund flow seamlessly. Viability gap funding and or blended finance, because ultimately we have to bring down to the cost of uh, b b lending to an affordable level, level where the developer fi finds it comfortable to move with. And uh, <coughs> provision for credit enhancement for bonds floated by offshore wind and can enable competitive rates for these bonds. See, as under in India, we do not have a green taxonomy defined in place. Even smaller countries like Bangladesh, they have to defined you. And uh, Government of India, RBI, and Finance Ministry, they are working. Very soon, we'll be have a green defined taxonomy in place. Then we have EPC and OM financing, as I said. See, IREDA is the agency who first introduced working capital facility uh, for specific Pro, uh, pro product specific project best uh, loans, which is nothing but a working capital. Generally, working capital extended by bank, uh, bankers, not by non-banking finance companies. But we have introduced that mechanism and product because we understand the sector pretty well. And that has become a tool for faster development of solar as well as onshore wind in India as on date. And uh, then guarantee higher risk of offshore wind OM versus traditional solar and wind. Then vehicle lease finance. You require fair amount of infrastructure where vehicle as well as your uh, platforms which and uh, specialized cranes and other equipment which will be required for uh, uh, offshore wind products. And then we can have these shared resources 
with our neighboring countries and other developing economies who want to take the support and uh, handholding from India in the time to come. Like through International Solar Alliance, we are handholding the underdeveloped economies for faster uh, solar development in their countries. And here, my I'll humbly request to the multilateral uh, agencies and uh, developmental banks to come forward and handhold the way they handhold the today established RE in India, that is vanilla solar or your uh, onshore wind, et cetera, since 90s. All the leading agencies partner IRIDA since 90s, including World Bank. But uh, it is again pertinent to mention here that since three and a half years, we are not drawing a single line of credit despite having the clearance. We are paying the commitment fees. This is very important point to note because Today, the landed cost of those, the, these developmental agencies are not becoming competitive on the point of usage. It may be concessional at your country, but when we are developing a project, we have to see the, the point of destination, whether the landed cost is becoming cheaper or not. See, hedging cost is one of the major issues. And to address certain uh, issues with respect to the hedging, uh, not only IRIDA and other government NBFC like PFC and RDC and uh, some of the banks, they are opening the office in the gift city so that wherever it is, uh, we can go for foreign currency loans, which we can uh, raise and uh, support at, at the same time. The servicing can be done through foreign currency, particularly in case of green hydrogen and hydrogen derivatives, where we are expecting fair amount of exports so when the proceeds will be coming in uh, foreign currency, no need to go for any hedging. So natural hedging will be allowed. So we are working out holistically all kind of mechanism in place. See, challenges are huge, and uh, at the same time, opportunity also huge. We know how to t translate the challenges into opportunity. India in the past, particularly in the COVID period, has already exhibited to the rest of the world. If we work unitedly, how we can overcome the challenges and how it can be translated to opportunity. And if you see it during this period also, our growth has been phenomenal. And particularly in Irena, uh, we had the historic growth in that worst economic crisis period also. So once our IPO is in place, uh, we are expecting in the month of November, we'll be hitting the market and uh, our equity base will be enhanced and we will be in a better uh, better uh, position to support the larger fund requirement in this space in particular. Thank you. There's certainly an amazing opportunity in India and a need for offshore wind. Uh, there are big challenges and, and your point on concessional financing I think is important. It needs to be brought some lower cost financing to help supplement the, the, the requirements for capital. Yeah, despite this uh, COVID and other things, still uh, uh, India is considered to be a most preferred destination for investment in RE in the, in the country. Perhaps that is again. And uh, most of our funding is coming from FDI route. Thank you. So, Mr. Mr. Trong, turning to you, uh, does Vietnam have a, a problem with, with not enough space for solar? Is this why you're looking at offshore wind? What, what are the reasons for Vietnam looking at offshore wind? And are there other benefits such as um, supply chain that you're looking to get from, from offshore wind? So uh, thanks for your question. And I think that uh, first of all, so uh, Vietnam, we are uh, in our um, uh, energy strategy. So uh, we focus on the um, renewable energy to instead of the uh, traditional uh, energy. Uh, as you know that uh, Vietnam we also have a good potential for the traditional uh, energy, but uh, uh, we will uh, follow up the uh, trends. So uh, this is our uh, general uh, strategy. So uh, the reason why Vietnam we uh, come with the uh, offshore uh, wind um, power, and there are a lot of the reasons that I think that three minutes we cannot explain all. But uh, I will uh, focus on the four main uh, reasons. So uh, the first one is, uh, as you know, that uh, offshore uh, wind power is uh, renewable uh, and clean and high sustainable on a large uh, scale. So uh, distributing to uh, reduce the greenhouse gas emission, uh, aligning with the Vietnamese commitment to the international effort at the COP26, as you know. 
So uh, the second uh, reason is Vietnam has the uh, very good, uh, very last uh, natural advantage to develop the onshore wind energy, as I explained uh, um, uh, already to you. So we have a very uh, long uh, coastal uh, beach, uh, 3,000 kilometers, and very good uh, wind speed. Um, and uh, mostly, so uh, concentrates on the central of the country. The third reason is Vietnam. Uh, we have the uh, oil and gas, uh, the petroleum industry is uh, quite developed. Uh, we have uh, been our supply chains for oil and gas industry with the infrastructure, uh, manufacturing zone, uh, uh, a lot of the utility. Uh, for the oil and gas industry. And we think that this is uh, one of the, uh, our advantages uh, to go with the offshore wind recently. So uh, the first reason is uh, offshore wind is the new industry. It's not only for Vietnam. It's also for uh, the region, for our world, uh, in the many countries. So um, therefore, we think that uh, uh, the gap between uh, Vietnam and other countries in this industry is not mm, so big. So uh, with our uh, advantage, so we can uh, catch up and uh, even uh, we have uh, our hope to uh, lead uh, uh, this industry uh, in the near future. So um, I think that uh, uh, with our plan uh, for the Electricity uh, development now, so we have uh, facing a lot of the challenges. Uh, we uh, put a very ambitious um, target uh, with the six um, gigawatt, so up to 2030, and uh, try our best to reach uh, six, uh, seventy up to ninety gigawatt uh, up to 2050. So uh, uh, this is a very uh, challenging for Vietnam, but uh, we try to overcome that uh, with our own effort. And we, we um, much appreciate uh, all the cooperation uh, from the international organization uh, from other countries. So uh, to help uh, us uh, to uh, achieve our um, goal uh, with the offshore wind development. Thank you. Vietnam has certainly set some ambitious targets and, and it needs to do offshore wind. It, it feels that you have to have the offshore wind as part of your future energy mix. Um, I implore you on, on setting those targets, so good luck on, on getting them. Mika, I'm going to come, come across to you on the other end. Um, perhaps you could talk a, a bit about Japan's journey and, and where are we at now? What, what, where is the state of the market and what are some of the, the challenges that are facing the, the offshore wind market in, in progressing there in Japan? Yeah, thank you very much for asking. That Japan's offshore wind development that we are, you know, still uh, slow to be developed, but we are reaching some kind of uh, the several hundreds megawatt bases that 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 this year, and then also that we can say like um uh, we the government target for offshore wind is rather a little bit smaller uh, gigawatt base. The official target is a 5.7 gigawatt by 2030 in operation. And then people sometimes mention about 10 gigawatt by 2030, and then 30 to 45 gigawatt by 2040. But it is mentioned in the kind of a public-private council's uh, vision, and then it means only pipeline. It's not the kind of a COD number. So I think that the, we need a kind of ambitious target is needed for the uh, renewables as a whole, and then offshore wind as well. And then it has to be in line with ambitious climate target. And then um, uh, according to our study, we need to have at least more than 
20 gigawatt of bottom fix uh, offshore wind by 2035, and at least that the more than five gigawatt of floating offshore wind by 2035. And then, of course, that um, we haven't reached that one gigawatt yet. And then another difficulty that um, um, we are facing is like uh, developers has to be take care of all local acceptance. That is, it, it, there's, if there is no kind of a sign of the local acceptance, no look, uh, no C designated area is uh, cited by the government. So the, uh, but, but you know that uh, having the local acceptance with the local uh, people, including the fisheries, that it's very difficult. So I think that uh, there has to be some uh, visible government uh, leadership that uh, to uh, have the ac um, acceptance of the local people here. And then we need a kind of a clear policy framework for that. And then another difficulty is the uh, grid connection. The uh, regional in interconnection that between different power market areas, like uh, Japanese government started the discussion, like a master plan of grid system. But uh, if I see the inter in inside of the power uh, market, like inside of Hokkaido or some part of Tohoku area, the grid system is not uh, sufficiently constructed. So the, it is left to the developers to develop the uh, transmission system until the connection area, and then sometimes it's very expensive. So the, uh, they cannot have the kind of a, the um, foreseeable market when they get into that kind of area. So I think that the local acceptancing and then grid connection has to be cleared by the uh, government leadership. And then those frameworks that the uh, uh, developers that can join the certain project. Thank you. Uh, Yihua, so Koryo is a, a developer that's very active across the APAC region. Um, could you talk a, a bit about maybe some of the commonality that you see across the different markets? Um, anything you think that they could learn from each other and ideas maybe for collaboration between them? Thanks for the question, Mark. Um, indeed, we're very active in, in APAC. Um, I think, as I mentioned, we have an announced pipeline of more than 15 gigawatts in APAC. But I'd start by saying, you know, it is a challenging and interesting job for me because APAC is a constellation of very different markets. So maybe to flip your question, you know, first, how are the markets different? In, in particular, the four that are sort of represented on stage, you know, so if you look at India and the Philippines, they have a liberalized electricity market with sort of a pool price and an ability to do private PPAs. If you look at Vietnam, it's a central state utility model. And Japan, it's you know, obviously liberalized again. Um, if you look at GDP per capita, Japan is way out you know, in, a, in a wealthy country. The others are more in the fast growing stage. If you look at the history or uh, basis for the legal system, again, each of these jurisdictions are very different. So you know, I would say these are the, the obvious differences, and that means one approach that you take to one market may not be the, the right one for the other one. Commonalities, um, I think it was presented earlier this morning, um, a lot of um, potential to, to really reduce um, CO2 emissions because we're starting with a heavily hydrocarbon base in the APAC region. So definitely a lot of uh, potential for offshore wind to contribute to the energy transition. Um, but that coupled with that, I would say in all of these emerging offshore markets, the grid is not quite ready for it, uh, both from a physical sense and from the sense of a policy framework. So how do you deal with imbalance that creeps into the system? How do you deal with curtailment? You know, how do you physically curtail? So in Australia, the order in which you curtail is different to in, in Vietnam and, and perhaps in India. Um, so I think these are, and then if I zoom back out, you know, the commonalities are we really got to decarbonize Asia, uh, dec decarbonize APAC. The issues, especially the grid issues, is a subset of the broader issue of, of energy transition in general, right? So um, you will have the same issues if you're trying to integrate solar and onshore wind as you do with offshore wind. So in terms of a suggestion from the developer side to the government representatives, one thing I'd say is think of these not as an offshore wind issue, but an overall energy transition issue. So how do you liberalize and reform the power market to better account for intermittent uh, generators? But then specifically on offshore wind, um, our, and this is perhaps not 
necessarily learning from each other, but just sort of ascribing, uh, sorry, as, aspiring to a common goal. I'd say um, be patient and realistic in the time frame for delivery for offshore wind. It's a very large ship. If you think of the analogy, it's a very large ship that takes a long time to sort of steer in the right direction. Um, I think I saw in another conference somewhere else that the average time from granting of exclusivity of a site to the developer until the time the project completes, on average ac across the world, is about seven years. Um, and, and, that, and that is quite a long time, and perhaps for some of these emerging markets, they prefer to see quicker wins. So the policy prescription, I would say, is be patient, because actually it, it does take a long time for us to, to get an offshore wind project operating, but believe that once the ship is pointing in the right direction, there's a lot of momentum. So believe that seven years from now, you're going to get you know very significant amount of um, of green electrons, and therefore sort of commit to to having an ambitious but achievable target in the future. Thanks, Yihua. We're we're running out of time already. It's gone very quickly, but I'm, I haven't seen any questions on the app. So if you've got any questions in the audience, please put them into the app, and we can try and answer them in the last few minutes. Um, I'd like to come to the rest of the panel and, and come to the subject again on collaboration. Are there any examples in your countries or your markets of collaboration between different countries on energy or industry? Anything you think that, that might be able to cross over into offshore wind or any ideas that you might be able to, to bring and good ex examples of, of best practice? Any, any volunteers to answer that? Mr. Das? See, Ajay was talking of solar and uh, wind. We had in the past all the developmental agency to partner in India, be it World Bank or KW, ADB, KPD, maybe through Green Technology Fund or technical assistance. And in wind particularly, we had uh, Denmark partnering us and uh, the technician from Denmark coming and stationing in uh, our ministry as well as our office, so handholding for this uh, preparedness. So, uh, and even in uh, waste to energy, bioenergy, I think all the RE space, we had uh, technical assistance from the developed economy and the developmental agencies. And uh, any uh, industry which is in the nascent stage, and if you have some established player, Definitely, you will get their support, and you should get their support. And uh, we have fair amount of experience, as I was telling, for financing since 1990, we are partnering with Erida. Last three, four years, because of obvious reasons, uh, cost factor is not happening. That is, finance is one part. But technical uh, support and uh, guidance and handholding, that also we are ha having from this uh, global players. And the same way, we are expecting from the developed economy as far as offshore wind is concerned. See, <clears throat> uh, first of all, uh, we need to have three things in place to become successful. We need to take the support from the developers, that's fine. Those who are established, those who are experienced. But at a country level, first you should have the developer's conviction, that intent of doing it. Then you need to have commitment from government policy. Then third, you should have clarity from the lender's perspective. If these three principles are adopted, with the handholding of those developed economy, those who have already established, I think any country, any economy, they can transition these challenges into opportunity very faster. And India is quite uh, well prepared. We are in talk with uh, various agencies. Already, uh, World Bank as well as uh, ADB, they have uh, sanctioned certain line of credits to uh, with the government of India, but that is in a very minuscule way. We have a huge requirement and huge, and our economy is also pretty huge. And we are determined to become the third largest economy by the year 2027 to 30. So the fair amount of investment in India will be required and we'll be requiring the technical support as well as financial support. And we need that financial support only in the nascent stage, not in handholding. And my request to all, we should not seek the help once we are developed. But then we become uh, addicted to support. 
which you do not want, and no country should adapt for that, then we will not have that kind of trust and reliance of those developed economy or developing agencies to support. So th that becomes a habit, like if you are handholding me, I love to handhold. But that kind of uh, act, uh, practice and activity will not be there. And I'm sure uh, already Sri Lanka has talked about open, those who are having uh, uh, opportunity for sharing the logistics and the resources, they need to and ought to hand older to bring down the economy and to enhance the scale at a lesser time. So that is also one of the crucial factors. Thank you. So collaboration on finance, yeah. collaboration with governments, so perhaps through the Global Offshore Wind Alliance, and collaboration with industry. And Mika, perhaps I come to, to you just, just briefly. Oh, so, sorry, Rodel, you wanna, did you want to? Mika, um, perhaps you could just talk not... about the sort of government, uh, government industry task force, Namika, okay. um, in Japan yeah. and, and how Thank that's you very helped. much. So the, uh, of course the, the government uh, private industry talk is quite important, but at the same time that sometimes the some government part and then industry part focusing on Japan's own technology. But I think that I'm really concerned that if we just focusing on that Japanese own technology, it will take years and years to establish. So the, uh, maybe the collaboration with the foreign companies that the major developer and the supply is quite important. And then I, I do not want to admit uh, this one, but it is currently seen that Japanese, Japanese market is uh, somehow rigid, small scale, and a slow paced. That is a reality. So in order for the Japanese market to catch up with the global trend of the offshore wind development, I think that the Japanese industry and the government tried to collaborate with our regional partners, especially the neighboring East Asian countries and then areas, and uh, um, you know, take opportunity to, you know, for example, joint ship operations, port and supply chain load sharing, those kind of issues are quite crucial to develop Japanese market as well. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Thank you for being candid and, and open on your comments. I think it's really important to... to uh, See, I think India and Japan is going to have a very close tie of as far as uh, green hydrogen and its derivative is concerned. We are uh, determined to become uh, one of the largest export hub as well as manufacturing hub in India and we are gearing up our all port and nearby port areas for that. And uh, very soon, I think India and uh, government and Japan government is working towards in that line. And many of our developers have already started to set up their projects with respect to green hydrogen and its derivatives outside India. And uh, they're targeting Japan market uh, um, quite potential to <laughs> thank you. Rodel. Yeah, just a quick one. Collaboration should be based on the needs and uh, needs of the country being assisted and based also on the circumstances. Uh, for the Philippines, I guess, uh, technology transfer and capacity building will be key. Uh, this will be vital because for the very reason that the best practices of um, leading economies on offshore wind will be helpful and also we can avoid mistakes uh, already done, thereby uh, hastening the process of offshore wind development. One key factor would be on the ports uh, development, sea ports development. I think that's one key uh, key aspect that we should learn. Uh, we could learn something how 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 other jurisdictions develop port to support offshore wind generation uh, facilities, particularly in the assembly, the operational maintenance, and the operations. That's all. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Thank you, Rodel. I think we have 25 seconds left. We have one question, and I'm going to take the, uh, the chair's prerogative of answering it, I'm afraid. So we have a question on asking about how do we unlock the huge amounts of finance that's required to accelerate offshore wind, and how do we make this finance affordable in, in emerging markets? And I think getting the fundamentals of these markets right so we can encourage investors, have bankable projects, trustable frameworks that, that are transparent uh, to allow these investors to come in and be confident in that market is, is critical and on reducing that cost of finance. So we're working a lot at the moment on looking at concessional finance to bring down that cost of, of capital, but also looking at uh, risk mitigation instruments to help 
again, reduce that cost of capital, which is already very high in some of these developing countries. Uh, there's lots of things to be done, and there's lots of areas of risk, and it will depend very much on a country-by-country -country basis. So with that, uh, I wanted to thank all my panelists um, for, for your remarks today. It's been great to have you, so thank you very much. And thank you for everyone.